All right, so the, the sermon for this evening is actually going to be, ties in real well with what I preached on this morning, with just kind of getting your heart right, and um, it's definitely not a re-preach of this morning's sermon, but, but they go hand in hand, and what I'm going to preach about this evening is taking heed to God's warnings, and you know, when you take heed to something, you're taking notice, you're paying attention to it, you're, you know, it's similar to beware. Right? God has given us certain warnings in his word and certain things that he specifically says, hey, take heed to this, pay attention to this, listen to this, look at this, because I don't want you to fall into this sin or that sin or, or into this trap. I want you to do what's right, so pay attention and take heed. And what I'm going to be doing is, I haven't decided exactly how many weeks I'm going to do this for, but a, a, a mini-series, a short series on the different places in the Bible that tell us to take heed, where God is specifically, or the Bible is specifically saying, hey, watch out for this, take heed to this, because it's, it's, it's really kind of um, separating and just, and just making a distinction, saying, all right, you know, I've told you a bunch of things, but pay attention to this. And what these are, we're going to reread this in 1 Corinthians 10. We have a lot of examples of things. But ultimately, we have a lot of examples in general in the Bible of things that we shouldn't be getting into. And lots of areas in life where it's going to be very easy to start backsliding, very easy to get into various sins, unless we're really paying attention and staying focused and taking heed to the word of the Lord when we start forgetting things and getting really relaxed and start making more and more compromises in our life. We're not doing a good job of taking heed and making sure we're making strong stands. The more we allow things to get into our life and allow wickedness or sin or just, just start relaxing on maintaining a really firm position on God's word, that's when, when things start to slip and slip out of control. It's a very slippery downward slope into, into just backsliding and, and into win it, wickedness and all kinds of various sins. So we're going we're gonna to pay attention. I'm going to be focusing on one specifically tonight. But I want to reread here in 1 Corinthians 10. Look at verse number 1. The Bible says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. So what he's doing, he's taking the events that happened when Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt, when he took them out of bondage and he's spiritualizing what exactly took place there and saying, hey, you know what? When they came through, when he led them through and parted the Red Sea and they walked through on dry land, it's like they got baptized because they were completely surrounded in that water. They were baptized going through that. He says they ate of the same spiritual meat, the manna that came down from heaven. They ate, they all ate of, and partook of that food. You know, they all drank of the same spiritual drink, you know, the drink that literally came out of the rock. When they, when they were thirsty and he had drink and, and God sustained them and, and these various miracles, they all drank of this, you know, the same baptism, spiritual meat, spiritual drink. And again, just signifying, we know that not every single soul was saved that came out of Egypt, but, but just he, what he's doing when spiritualizing it, just showing like a, a type of salvation that, hey, we're, they're baptized, they're saved, you know, and he's going to relate this story to other things then that happened. And the reason why he's doing this, I believe, is that he's trying to demonstrate that, hey, even though you're saved, you can still get into these sins. You can still fall into these traps. And that's why we need to take heed. So let's keep reading here. Verse number uh, five. But with many of them, God was not well pleased. This is the transition. He said, hey, they drank of the drink. They ate of the meat. They were baptized. But there were still some people God was not pleased with. For they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. He's speaking to the church, to the church at Corinth in this epistle. He's saying, look, these are examples for us to follow. All of these things that happened to them in the wilderness, they were saved, they were baptized, you know, yet they still got into these things and we need to take heed and look at what happened there so that we don't lust after evil things the way that they did. 
Because if it happened to them, it could happen to us. That's the point that he's trying to get across here. Look at verse number seven. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed and fell in one day, three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. These are all examples of all these things. And as you read them, you can remember a lot of these stories, if you know your Bible pretty well, of all these events that happened in the Old Testament, all the times God got angry with the children of Israel during that whole time, that, that, that 40 years they were wandering about in the wilderness. And he's saying, these are all examples. They're not there for no reason. We need to pay attention to this stuff. And what I'm going to be doing in my series is I'm literally going to be going through all of these various examples, not necessarily just from 1 Corinthians 10, but in general, when the Bible's telling us to take heed to things, I'm going to be kind of extrapolating uh, each you know, fornication or idolatry and things that are specifically mentioned here because he's pointing them out specifically and saying, hey, pay attention to this. Hey, pay attention to this. Hey, pay attention to this because we don't want to fall into the same traps. So I'm going to be going through, you know, kind of topic by topic on all these various things where the Bible is specifically saying, watch out for this because we need these warnings in our life. We need to be able to make sure we're diligently following the word of God and not getting too relaxed and not just allowing way too many things to happen to where we're going to fall into this sin and get caught up into sins that, that we don't even know how we got there, right? Verse number um, 11. Now all these things happened unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are coming. Now this is an amazing statement in and of itself. He's saying, you know what? All these things that happen, the reason why they're even written down is for us. It's for us today. It's for us upon whom the ends of the world are come. He's saying all of that happened. It happened, but it was actually written down and retained in the Bible, in God's word, for us to learn from, for us to look at, for us to use as examples. If God decided it was that important to retain in his word for thousands of years, we really ought to be paying attention to it and just have that reverence and respect for God's word that, that we can look at these stories and say, hey, let's not just read over it. Let's just not gloss over it and say, oh, I got to do my Bible reading and you just read some chapters and you just move on. Let's pay attention to what it's saying. Let's look at the examples and say, oh, this happened thousands of years ago. I can't believe they did this. Well, you ought to be able to believe they did it because it's written there so you don't do it. If it happened to them, it can happen to you. Verse number 12, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. The Bible's warning us to take heed and say, hey, I th you, know, you might feel like you're a super Christian. Everything's going well. I'm reading my Bible. I'm soul winning. I'm praying, man. I'm never going to have any problems. And I'm not going to have any problems. I gave up all these sins and I'm doing this and I'm doing so great. And look at me. I'm standing strong. He says, you take heed. You can be standing strong one moment and falling down the next. You pay attention. It just takes one blow sometimes to shake you off your footing. And if you're not paying attention and taking heed, you could be just so lifted up in how well everything's going that you get blindsided because you're not paying close enough attention and just completely get, get knocked down. We need to be paying attention on many fronts. Ultimately, it boils down to our sinful lusts and desires of the flesh, but we need to be paying attention to that stuff. We need to be keeping it in check and not becoming overconfident in our ability to not sin. An example of this would be, you know, and I'll get into all this stuff uh, when I get into various sermons on different topics, but just, just real briefly, um, you know, you could say, oh, well, I've conquered, any, you know, as a man, I've conquered any, any, you know, lusts of my flesh after other women, and so it's fine now for me to look at pornography. It's fine for me to go to a strip club and talk to a friend and preach the gospel to him because I'm not going to look at that. You know, and just thinking that, you know, and that's an extreme example, right? That's a very extreme example. I get it. But this mindset of just thinking that you, you know, there's no way you can fall. No, we need to be making sure and making safeguards for ourselves so that these things don't happen, so that we are taking heed and say, I'm taking extra precautionary steps to make sure that I'm not going to fall into these, these traps, into these sins where I may be tempted. 
and trying to remove ourselves from as far as possible from, from any elements that can, that can be tempting to us. Look at verse 13. It says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. So we all will be facing temptations, but none of it, and we need to remember, none of it's going to be more than you could stand. There is a way out, but you know what? You need to find that. You need to choose that way out. The problem comes in is when people choose to indulge in the lust of the flesh and in the temptation instead of choosing to, to get away from it and to flee from it and take the way out. We need to take heed because if we're not taking heed, we will fall. Turn forward to the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 4. So it's a little bit of an introduction about kind of into the series. And what we're going to be covering specifically tonight is, is a real broad topic of just taking heed to God's laws, the law of the Lord, the Old Testament laws, the things that God told us not to do. And we'll get into some of them specifically in later weeks. But this comes up as just kind of a generic term multiple times in the Bible of just, hey, you need to take heed to the law of the Lord. You need to take heed to what's written in God's word and what he's telling you to do. We need to be paying attention to that and taking heed. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse number 9. Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently. Diligently means very, very carefully. I mean, you are putting forth effort. I'm keeping my soul diligently. It's really important. I'm focusing in on this. Lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life, but teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons. And again, this goes to similar to this morning, you know, keeping your heart. We need to put priorities on the things of God, and we need to be diligent about them. As soon as you start to just let them slack, you know what happens? They start to just go out of your memory. You start to forget about them when it's not that important, when you think, oh, I've got this all covered. I mean, it's like people we talk to, even just out sewing, people say, oh, I've already, read the, I've already read the Bible. I've read the whole thing. They don't know what it says at all. You start tell, talking about, oh, I didn't read that. Oh, I don't know about that. Oh, I don't, you know, and you start bringing up things. But they just think, oh, yeah, I already read all that. And they, and they allow themselves to forget. Why? Because they're not keeping it fresh. They're not being diligent about it. And you know what? For your Bible reading, don't be thinking that just because you've read it one, two, three, ten, twenty 10, 20 times that that's just enough. You need to be keeping God's words and keeping them diligently. I mean, really focus about it and thinking about it so that it doesn't depart from your heart. So it doesn't just, you just forget about it. Oops, forgot about that part of the Bible. And that you're taking the time to teach them to your sons and your son's sons. They're saying, you know, this is important. You need to make sure that your children don't forget about it. You need to make sure your grandchildren don't forget about this. It's that important that you need to be diligent and make this a priority to make sure they know, their children know, their children know, and that this is not forgotten out of your household forever as much as you could possibly do. Turn if you to chapter 27, Deuteronomy 27. Deuteronomy 27, verse number 9, the Bible reads, And Moses and the priests, the Levites, spake unto all Israel, saying, Take heed and hearken. That word hearken just means listen. Listen up, O Israel. This day thou art become the people of the Lord thy God. Thou shalt therefore obey the voice of the Lord thy God and do his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, saying, Take heed, listen up. You're the children of God. You've decided today to be the people of the Lord thy God. Now you better listen and obey. You better do. And hey, we can't forget that either. We're children, you're born again. You're a child of God. Listen up. Listen up, child of God. Your father has some commandments for you. Your father in heaven has, has some things for you to do. You better listen to him. Take heed. Take heed to what he has to say. They're important. It's very important. You ought to know what it is. If you don't know, you better start reading and get, and get learning. Turn if you would to Joshua chapter 22. Joshua 22, verse number 5. 
Bible reads, but take diligent heed to do the commandment and the law which Moses, the servant of the Lord, charged you to love the Lord your God and to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and to cleave unto him and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. So many times, and, and you know, I, I seem to bring this up, I think, frequently in sermons, but we need to really be looking at these words and, and pondering them and thinking about them on, on how important it is when it says things like take diligent heed. When, when you're diligent on something, you, you, you're doing everything you can to make sure you got it down and that you're not taking shortcuts and that you're not just blowing things off. You're being diligent to do the commandment and the law. And he says to, to, to cleave unto God and to serve him with all of your heart and with all of your soul, pouring your soul and your heart into God's commandments, into God's word, into your life of following and being obedient to God. This is what Joshua is telling us to do. This is what he's telling the children of Israel. And I believe this, is, this also applies to us today, that God wants us to be taking very diligent heed to following his commandments. Turn, if you would, back to Joshua chapter 1. And I mentioned this in this morning's sermon, but um, I'll bring it up again tonight. You say, what? Well, God's laws, God's command. I thought we lived in the New Testament. You know, that's all Old Testament stuff. Well, according to the Bible in Joshua 1, you know, God's laws are good for us. It's not like they're bad laws. It's not like God doesn't want us to, to enjoy life or, or to have any pleasure at all. But there are some things that can give you pleasure that are wicked and sin. I mean, just because, you know, having a, 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 an intimate relationship with somebody can, can bring a, a sense of physical pleasure doesn't mean it's not extremely wicked as hell for me to go lie with another, another woman and commit adultery. I mean, that brings all kinds of damage and heartache and hurt and, and just that little bit of pleasure. I mean, it, that's, it, we need to avoid that and flee from that. And God's Word tells us that. And it's extremely serious. That's why God put the death penalty on adultery. Because it's not just some little thing. Because you are doing a lot of damage. You are hurting your spouse tremendously and your family and, you know, and other people and other people's families. When you commit such sins and you break such trust, Joshua chapter 1, look at verse number 8. The Bible reads, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. How is the book of the law not going to depart out of his mouth? Because he's meditating on it and memorizing it and just retaining God's words in his mind all the time. Because he's being diligent to know the word of the Lord. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Day and night, regularly be meditating and thinking and pondering the word of God that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. Not your favorite parts, not just some portions, all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous and then thou shalt have good success. Do you want to have a successful life? Do you want to be a success? Do you want to get to the end of your life and be like, man, my life was a great success. Well, the way that you're going to do that is by meditating on the Word of God day and night. Meditating on the law of the Lord. Getting it in your heart so that it doesn't depart from your mouth. So that way when you speak, you're speaking truth. When you're making decisions, you're basing it on the truth from God's Word. Every aspect of your life can be diligently kept through God's Word. That's how you're going to have good success. Turn if you would to Matthew chapter 5. Now we're going to look at some New Testament examples. We're in New Testament. He's still explaining that we need to be paying attention to this and taking heed and, and not being sloppy with our, with our understanding or our, our meditating in God's word and in God's commandments and just saying, oh, well, we're just free from the law. We're under grace. So who cares? Let's not worry about it anymore. Well, that's not what Jesus taught. Jesus didn't say, hey, guys, we're in the New Testament now, so forget all about the old law. It's no good anymore, and you know there, there's, there's no reason to follow it whatsoever. See, the reason why people even come up with any type of understanding like that is because they misunderstood what salvation was even in the Old Testament. They thought that, oh, people got saved by following God's law. People never got saved by following God's law. People have always been saved by grace through faith. 
people have always needed to put their faith or their trust in the Lord to be saved. That's never changed. The only thing that's changed is understanding or knowing the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and putting our faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you in Matthew chapter 5? Did I have you turn to Matthew chapter 5? Look at verse number 17. This is Jesus Christ speaking. He says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law. I didn't come to destroy the law. Yet that's what so many people want to think today. Oh, the Old Testament laws, we don't have to worry about that anymore because Jesus came. Uh, Jesus didn't come to destroy the law or the prophets. He says, I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass. Has heaven and earth passed yet? Did I miss it? Oh, wait, no, heaven and earth are still here. Okay, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. So has one jot passed from the law? I mean, heaven and earth are still here, aren't they? Has one tittle passed from the law? No. Because all has not been fulfilled. Look at verse number 19. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments... And shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. You want to be called great in the kingdom of heaven? Do the least of the commandments and the greatest and teach other people, hey, we need to be following these commandments. That's what he's saying. He says, you're going to be great in the kingdom of heaven. When you're explaining to people and tell them, hey, let's follow all of God's commandments. It's not just Old Testament to be thrown away. It's something we ought to be following today and looking after and meditating in and keeping ourselves diligent to observe. Turn, if you would, to John chapter 5. Again, more examples from Jesus Christ. I mean, do you get more New Testament than Jesus Christ himself? I mean, what, like, he's the one telling people to believe on him to be saved. Yet what did Jesus tell people as well? He told people not to sin anymore. If the law is done away, if there is just no more law, then there is no more sin. I don't know why this is a difficult concept to grasp for some people. It's not. The only way you can even have sin is by transgressing God's law. That's the definition of sin. For sin is the transgression of the law, the Bible says in 1 John. Chapter 3, I believe. John chapter 5, verse 13. The Bible says, And he that was healed wist not who it was. When he was asked about who healed him, because he was carrying his, his bed on the Sabbath day, and the Pharisees went, Who told you to carry your bed? Well, the guy that healed me did. That's his story here, verse 13. And he that was healed wist not who it was, for Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole, sin no more, lest the worst thing come unto thee. Well, wait a minute. I thought Jesus came to abolish sin. And, you know, what, what does he mean, sin no more? I mean, sin no more it means follow God's commandments because something bad's going to happen to you if you continue to sin. Because that's the way God operates. Yes, you can, and look, at it, it's interesting because the, almost all the, the references I'm um, giving you, I mean, it's for believers, that's why in Matthew 5, he says, hey, if you teach men, if you don't obey the least of commandments and you teach men not to do it, you're least in the kingdom of heaven. He doesn't say you're not going to be in the kingdom of heaven. He says, well, you're least because you're still saved because believers ought to be following the commandments of God. It doesn't impact your salvation, but it impacts your standing in heaven. It impacts whether you're called great or least in the kingdom of heaven. Yes, born-again believers need to be taking heed to God's commandments. Know what they are. Know what a sin is. That way you can try to avoid sinning. That way when Jesus says, hey, sin no more or else something worse is going to happen to you, you don't have to say, well, I don't even know what a sin is because I just threw out that Old, that, that old Testament. I don't even pay attention to that anymore. Why don't you go back and read it and meditate therein and think about it and then you could know the difference between what's a sin and what's not a sin. John chapter 8. Another perfect example here. Woman taken in adultery. Verse number 10. 
When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I commend thee, condemn thee. Look what he says. Go and sin no more. Woman taken in adultery. What do he say? Go and sin no more. Now some people will point to this and say, See, that's what she had to do to be saved. No, he's not saying that's what you have to do to be saved. But you know what he's telling people? Look, she was taken in adultery. He said, don't, don't go out and just go and continue in sin. We need to be not sinning. Can you be saved if you commit adultery? Yeah. Can you be saved and then commit adultery and still be saved? Yeah. But is that what Jesus is telling you to do? As some slanderously accuse us of believing, as they did the apostles, of saying, oh, well, go ahead and sin that grace may abound. God forbid. Jesus said, sin not. At first, you don't have to turn there. Turn if you would to Psalm 1. 1 Corinthians 15, 34 says, Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. So we're, I mean, we're commanded in the New Testament. And look, 1 Corinthians 15, that's after even the resurrection of Jesus Christ for the dispensationalists who are going to want to say, oh, well, Jesus was still in the Old Testament, so no, in the New, you know, no. Even the Apostle Paul is saying, look, don't sin. We're not to sin. How can we not sin unless we know what God's law says? We need to be paying attention to God's law. We need to take heed. Because if we're not taking heed, we're going to get into sin and then something bad is going to happen to us, something worse. Because God, you know why? Because God disciplines, he chastens his children as a loving father should. When we're not paying attention, what, you know, my own children is a perfect example. You know, I tell them to do something, I command them to do something, you know, clean the room or something or do their homework, do their school. And then I catch them just, just off doing something else. And they say, oh, I forgot. I told you to do this. Oh, I just forget. Well, forgetting isn't a valid reason. You're still going to get a punishment. And with God, when he commands things, you can't say, oh, I didn't know. Now, if I didn't tell them something, I can't hold them responsible for, for doing, you know, if I didn't say to, to, to do something or not to do something. But here's the thing. You can't use ignorance because God's already told us. And it's available all over the place. It's here. You have to open up your ears and listen or open up your eyes and receive it. But he's already spoken. It's already there. We can't say, oh, I didn't know. It's right here for you. And it's your responsibility to, to hear what he said. Psalm 1. Look at verse number 1. The Bible reads, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth, now let this sit, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. And you know, I could go on on a whole other sermon topic on this one verse, but it's totally tied in with taking heed to, to not backsliding and stuff and to not getting down the wrong path even after you're saved because it says, bless is the man that doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. There's a lot of ungodly people out there that call themselves counselors. There's a lot of people who don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and they're ungodly and they want to give you advice and they want to give you wisdom and people go to that and Christians go to these ungodly counselors and the Bible says, hey, you're blessed when you don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Not when you do walk in the counsel of the ungodly nor standeth in the way of sinners, when you're not just right now, all the sinners are going over here and I'm standing right in there with all the sinners just doing what they're doing, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Verse number two, but his delight, what he actually likes, the thing that, that moves him, what, what he's delighting in, is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. Hey, we, we already saw in Joshua 1, you want to have good success in life. You have a lot of problems. You have family problems. You have other problems in your life. You have relationship problems. You want to have success and win at life? Why don't you try meditating day and night in the law of the Lord? In the truth, in real wisdom from God's word to help guide you and this is your godly counsel. This is where you can get your advice. What should I do in this situation? I don't know. Why don't I I'd be meditating in God's word a little bit more and I could understand what I need to do. 
Verse number three, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. So everything, you know, the person that's meditating in God's word day and light, in the law of the Lord, whose delight it is, to, man, I love God's law. Man, I love reading this stuff. This is good. I don't, I don't despise it. I don't hate, oh, oh we're, going, we're turning to Leviticus or Deuteronomy. I, I, I hate when we turn to those chapters. No, I love when we turn to those chapters. I love when we read the law of the Lord. I'm going to meditate in the day and night. Why? Because I want to be prosperous. Why? Because I want to have success in my life. I want to make right decisions. I want to do what's right in the eyes of the Lord. I want to, you know, wake to righteousness and sin not. Verse number four, the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 19. Talking about taking heed to God's laws and the importance of God's laws, even in the New Testament. We demonstrate we need to know God's law. We need to take heed to this because it is for our benefit. It is for our health. It is for our life. We need to be meditating in the law of the Lord and not being flippant about it and being like, oh yeah, I think I remember reading some of God's laws. No, we ought to know God's laws. Know the punishment for God's laws. Know how serious it is to break these laws. Just because they're not being enforced today, actually, that's even more reason to be meditating and knowing the way God thinks about these things because our wicked government, our wicked society thinks that even committing adultery isn't really that big of a deal and that you just break up with your wife and just marry someone else and who cares? Not a problem. When the law of the Lord says no adulterers need to be put to death because it is that serious regardless of what the world's going to tell you, regardless of what society tells you, and start softening and, and making you think, oh, this really isn't a big deal. Everyone else is doing it. Meditate in God's words. You'll understand how serious it is. And then you can apply that in your life so when you're having marital problems, you're not thinking, should I get a divorce? Is this even a good option? It'd be pretty easy to do. I guarantee you're not going to be having those thoughts when you're meditating in God's law. Psalm 19, look at verse number 7. Psalm 19, verse number 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. God's law is perfect. You know, there's a lot of people out there that say, oh, I can't, you think that if a, if a, child that curses his father or mother should be put to death how you know what a wicked god no you're wicked the law of the lord's perfect there is nothing wrong with god's law there's something wrong with your understanding of justice if you think there's a problem with god's law and the law of the lord is perfect converting the soul another thing that you benefit from meditating on god's law is going to keep you humble it's going to keep you from being lifted up with pride because that's why the law of the Lord is perfect converting the soul. Because when you start understanding the law of the Lord, you start understanding what a sinner you are. And you start really understanding, wow, I didn't think that I was that bad. I didn't think that I did so many things that were wrong. Well, yeah, you actually do that many things that are wrong. And that's why you need to be saved. That's why you need a Savior. That's why your soul needs to be converted to just trusting in Christ as your Savior and not thinking that you're good enough to obey all of God's commandments because you're not. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. It's, you know, when you are reading and studying and meditating in God's testimony, even if you're not very smart, because what simple means, you're a simpleton. You don't, you don't understand very much. It will make you wise. It'll give you wisdom. Elizabeth, stop screwing around. Verse number eight, the statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. Again, we ought to be happy about it. Going back to the heart thing from this morning, the statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. Our heart ought to be rejoicing in God's 
laws and God's statutes. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Is your heart to the point to where you think that God's word is more precious to you than obtaining a bunch of gold? Think about that. Would you rather have the law of the Lord memorized in your mind or would you rather have a few bars of gold? Be honest with yourself. Again, this, and this, this touches on what I preach on this morning, where your heart is. Because if all you could think about and care about is just having that extra money and paying off my debt and buying this and buying that and buy, you know, and, and that's way more important to me than having some Bible verses memorized or having some God's law in my heart, your heart's not right. God's word, God's law is more to be desired than gold. Verse number 11, Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and this is what we're focusing on, the warnings, taking heed. By God's words, by God's testimonies, by God's law, we're warned. And in keeping of them, there is great reward. So not only are we warned about bad things, but we get rewarded with good things in keeping God's testimonies and his laws. Verse 12, who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. He's saying, I want to know even the things I don't know that I'm sinning. Cleanse me from the secret faults, the things that are hidden, the things I don't even know about, but I'm sinning and I'm, fault, I'm, I'm at fault with. Cleanse me from those, Lord, because I don't want to have anything to do with those things. I want to know your laws in and out so that I don't have these types of issues, so that I could just be cleansed from these secret faults. Verse 13, keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Things that you presume is that you make assumptions on things and, oh, this is just fine and you're actually sinning. Let them not have dominion over me, then shall I be upright and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Turn if you will to Psalm 119. Don't worry, we're not going to go through every verse of Psalm 119. Turn if you would to Psalm 119. Great passage of the Bible. Hey, you want to talk about a passage to be meditating in day and night? Psalm 119. Psalm 119, a healthy passage to give you a good respect for God's laws and his commandments and the exaltation and the way we need to view God's commands is found in Psalm 119. We're just going to read uh, the first couple of, of letters here that are the, the divisions of Psalm 119. Verse number one. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Again, it's a blessing. It's a blessing to walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts. Dil Notice the word diligently coming up again. Over and over again through Scripture, we see the word diligently being grouped together with knowing the commandments of the Lord, knowing His precepts, knowing His testimonies, knowing His law. We need to be diligent about it. It's not something you could slack off with. It needs special attention. It needs special focus. It needs to be taken heed of. Verse number five, Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. You want to live a life where you have no shame whatsoever? Have respect unto God's commandments. Understand them and know them. Then you have no reason to be ashamed whatsoever when you're keeping his commandments because you know them. Think about all the things you might have done in your life that have made you ashamed. I guarantee you they're going to be sinful things. But when you know God's law and you're meditating on God's law and you could, before you would even do anything that would, that would cause you to be ashamed, you could remember and say, whoa, wait a minute. I'm not going to do that. Why? Because the law of the Lord said it's not something I should be doing. 
Verse 7, I will praise thee with uprightness of heart when I shall have learned thy righteous judgments. I will keep thy statutes, O forsake me not utterly. Verse 9, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee. O let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hidden mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Meditating in God's word, keeping them in your heart, memorizing scripture is going to help you from sinning against the Lord. Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. Again, this desire to just want to know, God, teach me your statutes. Help me to know right from wrong, God. Instruct me. Teach me. And this is the concept we were going over with those Mormon guys out soul winning today. To say, well, don't you just want to know what's true? I mean, this is why, why we started the church to call it Word of Truth Baptist Church because we're interested in the truth. I want to know what's right. I want to know right from wrong. I want God to instruct me. That's what I care about more than anything. And if I'm wrong about something, I'd rather have someone correct me than just tell me, oh, no, man, you're good, and you're good, and you're good. And everyone just believe whatever you want because ultimately it doesn't really matter. If it's true for you, then it's true for you, good for you. I'm never going to tell anyone they're doing anything wrong and have that type of a mindset. It doesn't even make any sense. I mean, it literally makes no sense to just say everybody's right and there is no absolute truth. No, there is absolute truth. Absolutely. It exists. There's right and there's wrong. And I want to know what's right. I want God to teach me what's right. I don't want to sin against him. I want to know his statutes. I want to know his testimonies. Verse number 12, Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. With my lips have I declared all the judgments of thy mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies as much as in all riches. Again, going back to the heart, rejoicing in the way of God's testimonies as much as I would in all riches of the world. This is what I really care about. This is what makes me joyful and happy. Verse 15, I will meditate in thy precepts and have respect unto thy ways. I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. We need to take heed. Turn, if you would, to Luke 21. Last place I'll have you turn to, Luke 21. Hosea 4, verse number 10, the Bible reads, For they shall eat and not have enough. They shall commit whoredom and shall not increase because they have left off to take heed to the Lord. When we stop caring, when we stop paying attention, when we stop taking heed to the Lord and God's commandments, then a curse follows. It's in your best interest to really take heed to what God's commandments are and to learn them and to study them and to know them. Because what you're saying in Hosea 4, you're saying, look, you're going to eat and you won't be filled. You could keep eating and eating and eating. You'd be like, wow, I wonder, why am I never satisfied? Why am I never filled? Because you're not taking heed to God's commandments. You're not doing things the right way and God's causing you to not be filled. They do never have enough. Your way is not going to be peaceful. You're always going to have problems. And when he says you're going to commit whoredom, so you'll be sleeping around, he says, and shall not increase. You know, God's going to bless you when you get married, you do things the right way, and, you, and, and, and you're following his program. That's when God gives the increase. And he's saying, when you just forsake everything about me, you know what? I'm not going to give you the increase. You just go out and commit whoredom. It's not going to come. Because they've left off to take heed, because they didn't pay attention, they're not listening to God. Luke 21, verse 34, the Bible says, And take heed to yourselves lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life. And so that day come upon you unawares. Of course, Luke 21 is talking about, you know, when Jesus Christ comes back. But he's saying, look, you need to take heed to yourselves. O oh, believers, believers in Jesus Christ. Yes, you have eternal life, but take heed because you don't want at any time your hearts to be overcharged, just overrun with this drunkenness and the cares of this life and just being completely distracted from the things of God because you're not concerned with the law of the Lord 
and you're just, just blah, 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 you know, everything's going along. I'm just off in the world. I'm at enmity with God because I'm just living like the world and living like everything else and not paying any attention. And then what's going to happen? The Antichrist is going to come into power. And you know what? You're not going to be prepared. And you're not going to know what's going on because you've just been off in la-la land, you know, not caring and not taking heed to what the Bible says. Even with a right heart, as I preached this morning, you could have a right heart. We still need to take heed to ourselves. Obviously, we need to get our hearts right. Let's get on the right path and let's, let's focus and, and let's, let's get meditating in God's word and let's get to know it. But we still need to be paying attention, taking diligent heed and being very careful that we take heed to ourselves because even a, a right-hearted person can still fall when you're not paying attention to things, when you're just letting things happen, when you've opened up the door to more and more and more wickedness. So how do we take heed? I started getting to this earlier. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. We need to establish rules and boundaries for ourselves. That's one way to take heed because you need to be diligent. You know, obviously you need to get God's word, but if you have a pretty good grasp, you say, you know what? I think I know God's law. I think I understand it. And I'm reading in God's word. I'm doing this regularly. I'm keeping God's word in my heart and in my mind. So how else can I take heed? How else can I be careful? Establish rules and perimeters for yourself, boundaries to not go past, saying, I know that it's wrong. Here's a, here's a good one. Here's a personal example. I know that it's wrong for me to go out and get drunk. I know that that is something that can be a temptation for me. That's something I've already struggled with in my life. I don't want it to happen. I know that bad things are going to happen if I go down that path. So what do I need to do? Well, I already know it's wrong. I'm taking heat. I'm still reading in God's word. I'm not being deceived that it's actually something that's good. But you know what else I'm going to do? I'm going to take heed to myself and think that, oh, I conquered that so long ago because it has been a long time ago since when I finally just was done with it and quit cold turkey and have never had another drop of booze ever since. But you know what? I'm not going to stand here and just get all puffed up saying that, well, that never happened to me again. And you know how I'm taking heed? I don't go out to bars ever. When I first quit, I used to would go out and I would just order waters and stuff. But you know what? That is foolishness. You don't want to put yourself in situations where you're going to be even more tempted to fall and to get back into it. I'm not going to put myself in situations where the booze is flowing freely. I don't care if it's at a family get together or if it's at a bar or anywhere. I'm not going to be around that stuff. I'm going to choose not to have that. I mean, you know what? It's not going to be in my house. That's for dead sure. I'm not going to make access to it very easy, and I'm going to make sure that I'm in situations where I'm accountable all the time. That's one way of taking heed, paying attention, saying, no, I'm not, I'm not going to step over that line. And when I make rules for myself, I don't just break those rules. I don't just say, well, it'll be all right this one time, because then you do it that one time, and you know what? It'll be all right the next time, and then the next time. And before you know it, You've completely stepped past those boundaries that you've set up for yourself, and now you're getting farther and farther away. And now you're not taking as much heed. And now you're so much closer to just, oops, gave in, got a weak moment. But when you have those weak moments, when you've already set up a, a barrier around yourself because you've taken heed and you've eliminated any you know, possibilities to even put yourself in that position, then you'll be fine during the weak moments. Then you'll be fine when everything is going wrong. Hey, I've already established the perimeter. I need that perimeter. Because during the weak moments, I might falter and fall. I need to take heed that I don't fall. I need to pay attention. You need to make up rules, what you allow in your house. The things that you even allow just to be in your house at all, ever. What do you allow to view? What do you allow to put in front of your face? If you have a TV at home, if you have the internet, you need to be making sure you've got some very strict boundaries for yourself. And don't just start over just, well, because look, this happens. I know firsthand that this happens. It's easy to happen. You start saying, well, this is okay, but I'm not going to do any of this. And then, well... This is sort of like what I think is okay. Let's check that out. You say, yeah, it's got some things that I don't like, but I, I still kind of like it. I still kind of like this show. And then, oh, here's another one that's similar to this one. 
well, let's check it out. Oh, well, you know what's not exactly the same. And, and you start just going down that path. And before you know it, you look back and be like, wow, you know what? I used to have this boundary of just this was it. This was all I allowed myself to watch. It would just be a documentary, it'd just be this. And now look at how far we've come. Look at how far we've strayed off. Why? Because you're not taking heed and being diligent and setting up the boundaries and sticking to them. Who you allow in your life as close friends. Another thing to take heed to. And, you know, and, and, and a lot of these can be you know, their own sermons as to why they're so dangerous. But you know, the people that you spend your time around are going to be the ones influencing you. They will rub off on you. So when you come to church once a week and get around God's people for an hour, and then you go off and you go off and spend some time with the unsaved people doing this event, you know, play some sports over here with the more unsaved people, and I'm spending all my time just around the world and ungodly counsel, what do you think is going to happen? When you're just, just, these are my best friends. These are the people. I'm spending way more time out just getting influenced by the world than I am spending it in God's house. What's going to win over in that situation? You need to be, be setting up these, these rules for yourself. Who, who am I going to allow even to be close to me? And my, you know, who are going to be my friends? Who am I going to be spending most time? Am I going to be spending most time with people who maybe they're saved, but they're not even going to church, they're not living for God or anything else? Or am I going to try to spend more time with people who are on the right path and walking the right way? The places you choose to frequent, the places that you go regularly, what's the environment like? Is that going to rub off on you? These are all things that you need to be paying attention, the activities that you choose to do. Where, you need, you know, if you're going to be diligent, you need to be analyzing these things. And say, wow, I never even thought about that before. Well, take heed. Take heed to these things. Pay attention. Because when you're not paying attention, you're slipping off and you're sliding off. And you're, and you're not being diligent to, making, to keeping yourself unspotted from the world, as the Bible says in James. The Bible says, pure religion and undefiled is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. You want to have a pure religion? Keep yourself unspotted from the world. Let's, let's try to do that. Let's be diligent. And the way we keep ourselves unspotted is being diligent with God's commandments and understanding his commandments and saying, you know what? This is a sin and I don't want to be, have anything to do with it. I don't even want to be so close to this to where, you know, here's the line. This is God's line that he draws in the sand and say, you know what? Anything over there is a sin. Well, you know where I want to be? I want to be over here. I don't want to be looking over the edge and teetering over and see, see how far, I, how close I could get to where, oops, oh wait, I said, oh, because then you start stumbling, then you start getting over here and be like, well, that wasn't so bad. Let me see what it's like over here. And that's the way, that's the way the backsliding works and when you're not taking diligent heed. To, to set up your barriers in your, in, in, in your own life. One more example. I mean, you know, when, uh, and this is a big one. You think about just, just adultery and fornication and, and those types of sins. You know, this is, this is why, like, we, we set up rules. I have a rule to where I'm not going to be alone in a room with someone from the opposite gender unless I'm related to them. I'm not even going to be alone in a vehicle with someone of the opposite gender unless I have someone else with me, you know, unless it's, unless it's someone I'm related to, if it's my child or if it's my mother or something, you know, my aunt or someone like that where it's just like, you know, obviously there's, there's no, no, no chance of impropriety or anything there, but, you know, these are things, and you say, oh, well, that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. How, you know, no, it's wise. Now, I know, you know, I, I think I know, I believe I know that nothing would ever happen. I, I'm not intending on it to. My heart is, you know, in the right place when it comes to, to being faithful to my wife. But, but, but it's so serious and it's so bad. Why would I even want 
myself to be in a situation where I would have to remove myself from that situation where it could be very difficult. And if I was in some really weak state and we were going through some problems and we were having all kinds of things going on to where that might even potentially happen. I don't even want to be in that situation. So I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure that never happens. Why? Because it's so important. Because I value my wife. Because I value the word of God. Because God says that adulterers will be put to death. That's why. Because I care about it so much. So I'm going to take heed. I'm going to make sure, you know what? That is not going to happen to me. It's the same way we, we pay attention. We're not going to let any predators into our church. Why? Because we're not going to have any closed doors. We're not sending kids off to be in a room with some stranger, with some people who don't even know where they're going to be, have any access to our children. It's not going to happen. My children are not going to be defiled by anybody, you know, in this church or in my house because they're never going to have access to my kids alone. It's not going to happen. I'm going to make sure it doesn't happen. I'm setting up safeguards so that they can be protected and so that we can be protecting ourselves and taking heed to God's words and God's law. And you know what? I don't care if someone laughs at me. So, oh, yeah, you won't go. Yeah, you know what? I won't. I won't get into a, a, another ve you know, a vehicle or, or spend time alone with some woman somewhere. And you can laugh at me all you want. But I'm going to be diligent and take heed. And you ought to be wise and, and set up your own rules and your own boundaries and establish your own things where you say, you know what, this isn't going to happen. Not in my lifetime, not in my house. I'm going to be diligent, make sure this doesn't happen to me, my family, my wife, whatever. We need to take heed. Take heed to God's warnings. You know, when the Bible says to take heed, we ought to listen up, perk up our ears and pay attention. Because apparently God thinks it's something that's important. And I think it's important too, so we're going to be preaching through this series. And you know, this first one is a real general broad overview of just God's commandments in general and just meditating in Scripture and knowing His laws. In the coming weeks, we'll be going into some more specific areas uh, where we could really focus on taking heed to what the Bible says and, and teaches about that stuff. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for giving us these instructions, for, for um, telling us what we need to be focused on and paying more attention to, Lord. We ask that you would please give us wisdom and instruction. Help us to be stirred up, to be meditating in your words and to, to really know them, not to question them, not to have doubts in our mind. What does God's word really say? Lord, help us to know them. Help us to commit it to memory. Help us to, to have no doubts about what your word says so that we can apply your words to every situation and we can take heed and be diligent to make sure that we're not going to be backsliding or falling into sin, dear Lord, and that we can maintain our service to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.